Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, we're going to start out. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Kimberly Mack. I am the executive director. Sorry, I started a video now and I can't. Ah! Sorry, that was my fault because I'm trying to open the videos and now they're starting to talk. All right, it's done. I apologize for that. If that's the only tech issue we have, we're good. Um, again, my name is Kimberly Meck and I am the executive director of the Alliance of People with Disabilities. I am a white woman and I have long curly hair. I am currently wearing a black t-shirt with a black hoodie, uh, zip up hoodie over the top of it. Uh, and in the background, you can see partial ceiling fan, which I do not have on because it's cold outside. Um, Robin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Robin Tatsuda. I'm the executive director at the ARC of King County. Uh, I am a biracial uh, cis female um, with short, dark hair. I'm wearing a headset with a little microphone, um, wearing a, a dark sort of scoop neck shirt and a little <laughs> necklace. And I'm sitting in my home office, which is also my guest room. So you can sort of see plants behind me and a little bit of a bed and a window and things. You can't quite see, but it's distinctly possible that anytime this evening, my orange cat will make an appearance. She's currently on my lap right below my camera. So if she says hello, please welcome her with delight. Her name is Fluffers and um, I'm happy to be here as well. Thank you, I appreciate that Robin. Um, I just realized that I need to do one thing. Um, no, I think we're good. Okay, so today captions are available in Zoom, as I said before. Um, if you click on the show subtitle in your Zoom menu bar to turn them on, captions are also running in streamtext.net. Uh, uh, the URL is too long to read, but Robin has posted it in the chat for anybody who's interested. Stream text will allow you to enlarge the font and change the color and contrast of the captioning. There's also a chat feature on stream text. So you're welcome to submit questions or comments there and we will be monitoring those and voice any questions uh, during the session. We also have ASL interpreters available today. We're presenting in gallery view. So the interpreters should always be visible. You do not need to pin them please know that we have two interpreters. So if you pin the current interpreter, it could prevent you from seeing the active interpreter after an interpreter change. You do not need to be on Zoom to access this event. We'll read all questions out loud and voice any images on the screen so that content will be available to individuals calling in on the phone or who cannot see visual content. This event is being recorded and we will be answering questions periodically throughout the discussion. We ask you to please use the Q&A tab for any questions you have uh, for the panelists, uh, well, for the, for the uh, presenter, apologize, uh, and then use the chat tab for any general conversations or comments. The chart, the, the cart chat in stream text can be used for both questions and comments. And also a note that we'll, we will use both person with a disability and disabled person interchangeably, recognizing that different people's preference for person first or identity first language. You're on Robin. Thank you. Again, this is Robin. So let me orient everyone to this event. Uh, this is actually the third session of our Understanding Ableism monthly series. These events are hosted by the King County Disability Consortium, which is composed of over 40 disability serving organizations and individual disability advocates and activists. These Understanding Ableism events are led by the disability community, promoting disability justice within the King County enterprise. Our first two sessions introduce the concept of ableism, disability intersectionality, and the importance of allyship across all civil rights work. Tonight, we build on that discussion to explore racialized ableism. This fireside chat is gonna be fairly informal. Uh, we have a few questions uh, that we've prepared ahead of time to help move us through this conversation, but we anticipate much of the time will be organic. 
We will stop for questions periodically throughout the chat and remind everyone to make sure to type your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom, not in the chat box in Zoom. If you're using the stream text or the cart, there's a chat box in that feature that you can type questions into and we have someone monitoring that. Uh, so we have people monitoring both places for questions um, who will uh, voice your question as we move through the night. So with no further ado, we're very excited to have this conversation with Christiana Obe Sumner, and we are so thankful that each of you have joined us tonight. So Kimberly, do you want to introduce Christiana? Thanks, Robin. I'd love to. Um, Christiana's equity journey began nearly two decades ago, but in reality, they were born into this work. As the granddaughter of a Black Panther and daughter of a sociologist, they were raised to see all the ways in which humans construct society, ourselves, and each other. They are on a quest to discover the why of society and inequity and the how of what steps we should take to become an equitable society. Christiana, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Um Super exciting to see everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Christiana Obi Sumner. My pronouns are they, them. I am a principal consultant and founder of Epiphanies of Equity LLC, which is sort of the big picture social equity, but our North Stars really are at the intersection of disability justice, racial justice, um, gender and sexual identity justice, so LGBTQIA+. Um, as well as uh, class analysis, size, we do, we do it all. And it all comes down to intersectionality, as well as why do humans human and when humans are humaning with other humans and why do human things happen? And those human things usually end in an ism or, idea, uh, or an ology. Um, I am a caramel colored black person I'm wearing black uh, sort of secretary cat eye glasses. I am wearing a, uh, a cream and tan a sweater over a black long sleeve shirt. I have a, um, a wrapped amethyst and a white cord around my neck. And I am wearing a hat that is black and floral. I am sitting in a gaming chair that sort of looks like a three leaf clover coming up behind my head in a room that is full of stacks and bookcases full of books. There is a guitar case and a violin case behind me and a purple lace curtain. And there is a dog bed where you may see, and hopefully not here, a small black, white, and tan fluffy puppy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk about all the things and the stuff. Christiana, we're excited to have you as well. And I mean, just to sort of get this conversation going, I wonder if you want to tell us a bit more about what led you into this work um, and why, I don't know, why you're here tonight. This is such a huge question because it, it reminds me of that scene in Princess Bride, like, let me explain. No, let me sum up. Um, so I'm going to try to sum this up. Um, so I got into this work because I'm primarily black and disabled and, um, and particularly I'm autistic. And so, uh, pretty immediately I had to sort of figure out why I was, um, being treated certain ways, folks were acting certain ways around me. And I was sort of experiencing certain situations that were really harmful. Um, Without going into too much of that, I uh, some of this a part of this work was because of my experience in the school to institutionalization pipeline. Um, what that means is sort of the building blocks of my youth, um, as well as some of the other circumstances, led to a situation where from public I went from public school and sort of graduated, so to speak, into um, long term involuntary institutionalization. So I started a lot of this work at the intersection of um, as a black autistic person getting my IEP, getting my 
needs met in school, as well as uh, Mad Pride, or it was called Psychiatric Survivor last, uh, back then. In addition to that, I come from a family of disabled Black folks, some of which are developmentally disabled or they have acquired disabilities. But those developmental disabilities a lot of times came from intersecting systems of oppression. Um, my family uh, primarily uh, came up in uh, the Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, and specifically Camden uh, County, New Jersey areas, which are all places that have environmental racism. So they, um, similar to like, you know, Flint, Michigan. And so there's a whole generation of children with lead poisoning similar with the toxins which led, which led to a lot of the disabilities in my family or disabilities that were acquired through medical racism and malpractice or through other institutions like prison. Um, the third sort of reason why is because in my community before I became a consultant, um, I thought I would be a psychologist by way of counseling and social work. And so in addition to my experiences and my family and immediate communities experiences, I saw through that work first starting off as a peer counselor where I met my spouse, by the way, um, and then going into the work that I did in uh, specifically direct housing justice and the intersections of sort of uh, the, the intergovernmental relationship too of how to get folks the services that they need. Um, that kind of broke me, to be honest, and it's how I came into consulting from social work, um, especially doing housing coordinator work at Harborview at the advent of the coordinated entry system. And I started to really, really see, I think clearer than ever, the extent to which of, of the inequities are upstream. So I think this work that I'm doing now and my life's work will be continuing to walk up that stream and seeing where this is coming from and how we turn that around. I'm not saying that I will reach that goal, but that's why I say it's my life's work. Thanks so much, Christiana. I, before we sort of go into other questions, uh, first of all, I note the interpreter change. So um, I just really quick, you you used a term that I, I assume that many folks in our audience aren't familiar with. You said mad pride or historically called psychiatric survivor. I wonder if you want to just explain that real quick, because I, I imagine folks aren't familiar. Yeah, it's important to preface with saying that in this space, it's not to say um, zero um, in, you know, psychiatric uh, treatment centers, zero um, uh, pharmaceuticals or um, medications. Um, it is saying that there needs to be um, centered in any treatment plan, the uh, rights and consent of the person who is being treated. Additionally, um, while there has certainly been um, situations where um, through sort of the, the involuntary process, folks are still able to um, find sort of that pathway and grounded pathway that they're looking for. Um, there are some of us, however, that in that process of involuntary institutionalization, there was a lot of harm and trauma done. Um, as well as a paternalism and a feeling or even lived reality of not really having a pathway out of it when we were ready to leave. So that sort of vortex piece is sort of at the center of that, as well as sort of an embracing and a welcoming of your lived experience of this, normalizing it, which in disability justice, you know, we talk about recognizing wholeness, um, and so it's sort of seeing it as a whole. Um, in addition to being autistic, the mad pride aspect was being diagnosed with a schizoaffective and dissociative identity disorder. Um, and understanding that those are things that I could have as part of my body, mind, and my lived experience that does not require me to um, be institutionalized or medicated against my will and consent. Um, so a lot of that work was sort of navigating that space and um, trying to find solutions 
um, and continuing to advocate for solutions and policy initiatives and um, other sort of interventions where um, folks are at the center um, of their care and that they have the right and the choice to be in their body mind in a way that they feel the most comfortable. Gosh, thank you so much. My camera's off so you couldn't see me smiling and nodding, but I just, I just want to echo how, whether it be related to psychiatric uh, disabilities or other forms of disabilities, uh, unfortunately, our society is, is very paternalistic. The idea that some other person, especially a professional, knows better what you need for your mind and for your body uh, and, and, and will do things sort of to you or for you, but not by you or with you, uh, if that makes sense. And uh, there's a continuation of a sense of, of shame and certainly disempowerment that comes from that, where that concept of, of mad pride uh, or being a survivor and really just sort of Owning, like this is me and I'm okay, right? Uh, and and that is a huge push in the disability movement to say there is no shame uh, related to disability, and in fact, uh, the shame is really because of other people pushing it onto onto us, or onto me. So right. I just appreciate that. I, I I was just yeah yeah. <laughs> I love I love hearing one my, that. One of my favorite Mad Pride stories is there was um, at one point connected to a group in, I think it was, uh, it was somewhere in the UK, I think it was England, and they were giving, it, and this is also going to date me, so there's that, but they were giving out Bluetooth headsets back when that was a thing um, for folks who um, had conversations with their, with their um, visitors or their voices, um, mm -hmm. and they wanted to do so in a way where they wouldn't be otherwise, um, you know, targeted, harmed, approached. Mm -hmm. So the Bluetooth was a way of talking um, where folks just assumed, oh, you're talking on the Bluetooth. And is it perfect? No, but it did, it was sort of a harm reduction approach mm -hmm. to being able to live um, in, the, in the life that it was most resonant and affirming um, while sort of the rest of society and culture catches up. Exactly, it's not trying to change the person so much as help society better accept and accommodate that person. Yeah. So anyway, I feel like we could talk about this on and on and on, but <laughs> Kimberly has some things to ask and I will, I will <laughs> step back. It, it, I love that story, Christiana. It's a shame that we have to find a way to normalize behaviors for everybody else. And that yeah. piece is, it seems to be a uh, constant um, to have to figure out how to normalize behaviors. Um, yeah. It's definitely so, not like the fix, but it's the harm reduction until we can get to the promised land. Definitely, definitely. So we have used the term disability justice before in this series several times, and it's used to describe the intersection of disability and racism. I was wondering if you could please explain a little bit more about how disability justice in the framework of racialized ableism. That's a new term that a lot of people might not have heard. Yeah, I, and I will say I've been, um, it's been interesting too, because it's a term that I started using and I don't, I, I don't know if it was just something that came out because I, those of the folks who've been in spaces with me know that I'll just I'll just say a term and everyone's like, where did that come from? Like, oh, I'm just saying it. Um, but there is some spaces around racialized ableism. Disability justice, really quick first, is a set of 10 guiding principles. And is a liberatory framework that was uh, co-created by a group of Black, Brown, Indigenous, queer, trans, non-binary, uh, disabled, multiply disabled activists and organizers, um, primarily coming out of the Bay Area. Uh, the 10 principles, I'm going to see if I can remember it off the top of my head, are intersectionality, leadership of those most impacted, anti-capitalist politics, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability solidarity, uh, commitment to cross-movement organizing, interdependence, collective access, and collective liberation. It didn't it? So if you think about those 10 principles, um, intersectionality, 
number one, right? Um, and so as part of this disability justice work, you know, and I say multiply disabled, so I shared with you about being autistic. I shared with you about um, being, being mad. I'm also not gonna share with you about being sick. And a lot of the racialized ableism piece came out of me being sick as well. Um, to be completely honest, my diagnosis sheet is like three pages long. Um, but even out of those diagnoses of, of trying to find why I'm sick, there really isn't anything that's happened. And it's not per se, I think about sort of what's happening with me, but just looking at, and we could talk about statistics and data, and we could be data centered, we can be data informed, or we can be data inspired. Um, but however you use that, we can show um, that there are disparities for disabled folks, for Black, Brown, Indigenous folks, and certainly in the sort of tertiary pathway of Black, Brown, Indigenous, disabled folks. So I think what's really important about intersectionality and racialized ableism is that it's not like a pie chart where you have 50% of this and 50% of this. A Black, Brown, Indigenous person is going to, of course, share in the experience of being racialized and be in solidarity with folks who are doing racial equity or anti-racism work. And disabled folks are definitely going to share the experiences of ableism and work towards disability justice or wherever sort of framework we use. So for me, in addition to experiencing ableism and experiencing racism, there is a third ex experience of experiencing racialized ableism. Now, it's important to think about this as a prism and that that is not the only thing uh, and not the only intersection. Um, it, in my experience, it isn't even just the only two pieces. Uh, I have for most of my life until I became sick about five, six years ago, had also been a person of size. Uh, I think at the largest 425 pounds. So I know that that was a part of it. I'm AFAB and so I know that is uh, sexism and misogyny is part of it. I'm AFAB and identify as non-binary. And so I know that that sort of tension is, is part of it. I am on Medicare. And so I know that that is part of it. I am under resourced and come from network impoverishment. And so I'm sure that's also part of it. Um, but in this conversation here, I think especially given what has happened in the last year, we really do need to make sure that we're seeing the ways in which uh, race and disability are compounding to this experience, which I don't think we talk about enough. A good example of this could be, um, you know, there is this uh, neighborhood in uh, the boroughs of New York um, in Brooklyn in particular, I believe, called Asthma Alley. And Asthma Alley before the pandemic was a, uh, was a sacrifice zone. And a sacrifice zone, especially in environmental racism, is a neighborhood or an area where when you're planning, say like a toxic site, like a, like a, like a, a highway or um, an, a power plant or something like that, there has to be runoff somewhere. So they plan that and that runoff goes over those sacrifice zones and a lot of times converge into sort of a compounded sacrifice zone. And there is a high tendency for that sacrifice zone to not only be over a residential area, but that statistically the number one determinant of living next to air, toxic air, soil or water is race. Asthma Alley was called so because it had a disproportionate number of folks who were hospitalized for asthma, um, seven times the national rate and 21 times of the other boroughs. And I do have a resource I can share out after this if anyone's interested in that data. Now, you have to think about this. If there is a, a town of folks who have asthma and then there's a respiratory pandemic that comes through, what do you think is going to happen? So then we think about sort of the response to that and how folks sort of reframed it into sort of an individualistic argument. Well, what is it that Black, Brown, Indigenous folks are doing that's leading to these outcomes? Um, is it that they aren't trusting? Is it that they aren't 
taking care of themselves? Is it the social determinants of health? It may be some or all of those things, but what we first have to recognize as a society is the ways in which we perpetuate these systems of oppression. So we have to think about the ways in which we have created environments that in itself are naturally um, toxic, figuratively and literally, towards Black, Brown, Indigenous folks, disabled folks, under-resourced folks, but especially Black, Brown, disabled, under-resourced folks. So you think about some of the data around this and prioritization of care, um, you think about the police violence conversation last year, and you start to see how when you start to compare the data we're seeing about disabled folks and the data we're seeing about Black, Brown, Indigenous folks, then when you put it together, what does that mean? And what my calls to action is, is we really do need to start intentionally, especially through things like participatory action research, look at those intersections carefully and center the leadership of those most impacted, which means Black, Brown, Indigenous, disabled folks plus should be at the center of everything. I'm serious, everything. Not just leadership and organizations, but policy, decision-making, appropriations funding, everything, but especially in terms of the pandemic. Uh, this is Robin. I am holding my finger up because I have three thoughts, but I do just want to note that somebody in the Q&A box said they were interested in more information on Asthma Alley. Is there any way, do you have recommendations on how folks can learn more about that? Yeah, I can pull it up because I have it. I can pull it up while we're talking because I have it in one of my PowerPoints in one of my virtual. Cool. Um, shoot, I know I had three fingers up and now I've lost one, but I have a, a, I have a story I wanted to share with you, Christiana, and I was really interested in what your input was uh, in response to it. So I don't know if you can search and listen at the same time. Um, I can try and then I'll let the interpreter switch and then good. Okay. So early on in my time working at the ARC, uh, I became involved supporting uh, a family where it was a, a single mother, she's black, uh, and had, uh, was a survivor of domestic violence, uh, was living, you know, below poverty level and raising three kids all on her own. Um, her son, I met them when he had just started sixth grade in middle school in Southeast Seattle. And he, I got pulled in because he was being suspended often, hadn't made progress academically. And mom was like, this, I know there's more going on. This isn't right. He had been placed in a, what I call an EBD classroom, like emotional behavioral disorder classroom. They saw his uh, behavior and learning needs as entirely based on, on the trauma that he had experienced. And so that was how they approached him. Uh, mom was like, mm -mm, I know there's more going on. I think he might be autistic. And nobody listened to her for years through elementary school. It wasn't until he got into middle school where people started to say, hmm, like you're saying he's autistic. I wonder about that. Long story short, he ended up getting an aut autism diagnosis. And luckily with advocacy, the school adapted how they approached educating him and, and things really got better. But just the fact that that as a, a black young man uh, who did have a history of trauma, there was you know, this immediate assumption somehow that that could be the only piece of his story, having a mom who was a, a single black woman. <laughs> I just like, I don't know, I wonder when I describe this to you, what comes, what comes to your mind, like what things you want to say about that. Yeah. Um... There's so many things that I want to say about this. Um, I think the first thing is we do have to talk about the school to prison pipeline. Um, there's also a book called Discrit, um, D-I-S-C-R-I-T. And it started off as a research article, um, but expanded at the intersection of disability studies and critical race theory. And they talk a lot about um, the sort of the racialized able, although they don't use that term. They, um, I also would say that they use 
language in there that is not eh. But the, 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 the point and sort of what they provide is, is still very valid um, in that they essentially say that the difficulty with this is that when you have such a strong systemic insidious sort of a tendency to criminalize and pathologize black, brown, indigenous to, uh, folks, body minds, period, then it, there isn't really any end to that. Um, and it also leads to intersectional erasure, which intersectional erasure is essentially that in a moment where you are to recognize a whole person's experience, you choose to focus only on one and completely erase the other. So, you know, you think about even down to like, there's a statistic, at least the last time I looked it up about a couple of years ago, um, that black, uh, black uh, boys were three times more likely to be expelled from preschool. Preschool. And then you think about sort of the adultification of black and brown children and how, and they've done so many studies around the teacher in, you know, in early childhood education or elementary education and sort of their tendency to see children in their grade um, who are black, brown or indigenous uh, or older than other students, even though they would obviously they wouldn't be. And sometimes as much as three or four years older, um, so they hold them to a different standard. It leads them to be more um, uh, marginalized, oppressed, and kicked out of class. Um, and then on top of that, uh, there's these other sort of barriers. So we're only really talking about the school system, and we're not even talking about the whole one of it, right? When I I'm a, I'm I was born in the '80s, um, and so by the time I went to uh, school they the ADA was only just coming on and and it and it's and I feel like it's still being you know implemented and and, and, and improved um but especially when I was coming on it was so much easier to 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 point to the fact that my mom was a single mom to point to the fact that she was under resourced and that we were housing unstable or homeless um, that she did not have a college education um, and that we were on state insurance. It was, it, so for them, what they knew was, well, black child coming from this sort of background, that, that must be what it is. Uh, they, they gave me so many tests, so many, um, and each one of those tests um, from uh, preschool all the way up uh, to uh, essentially undergrad. And, uh, seriously, they insisted, oh, okay, well, this child has developmental delay. Um, we think that it's more than developmental delay, but you have to see a doctor. Um, but the state insurance we had didn't cover that kind of doctor, so I never got the diagnosis. I just got kept getting tested. So I share this not to over identify with the story, but to explain the sort of all of the different constellation pieces around how that story could have happened. And, um, and I think it is important to consider those sort of upstream issues of, of what continues to lead to this. Someone said, you know, once is a story, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. So when we start to look at some of these uh, some of these data and statistics, this is way more than three people. This is millions of people, and we don't even know half the story yet because that's only the folks we've been able to collect the lived experiences and narratives from, or that we're sort of projecting or understanding of. Um, and so I think it goes to show sort of the depth of it. I think it's also important here to talk about why we need to look at the teachers as well as the curriculum, as well as the school systems and all these things. You know, I always say it's really important where inequity happens to make sure that we are addressing the crusting of that inequity, sort of like a tsunami, 
that the wave is coming and crashing onto folks. And that is where the um, harm is happening. And those crest areas, excuse me, are um, the institutions, the policies, the history, the systems, all of those different sort of things, right? But we also, at the same time, not either or, both and, have to hold that all of those things, while we are disrupting them, are the uh, results uh, and products of the actions and decisions and behaviors of people. It is the actors within the systems that continue to perpetuate, design, defend, or even just apathetically sort of ignore or passively just sort of like, well, them's the breaks, that's the way it's always been. But it continues to move that crest forward and sort of continue to flood further and further inland and harm more and more people. Um, the only difference is that it's covert. You know, the more that we start to shift the narratives around what it is that we're doing. Um, so it is important to consider that. Uh, and um, I think for everything. And so that means that when we're thinking about the ways in which we can save the world, we need to also think about the ways that we need to save the world from ourselves and disrupt ourselves as we are addressing the policies and the systems and the calls to actions that we have, considering the ways that the systems of oppression are harming us and that we are also bouncing back, reflecting, projecting the systems of oppression off of our body minds. Um, and I think a wise uh, word said is that if you reflect on how you may be, um, how you are participating in these sort of larger sociological systemic issues, and you say, I didn't do, you know, I'm, I'm clean and I'm absolved of it, it's probably important to think again. Because um, I'll tell you, I definitely am not going to sit here and say, even at my intersections, that I am blameless or I am um, resolved of anything of, of, of constantly having to disrupt even myself. So it's definitely something everyone should do. This is Kimberly and the, everything that you say is, is totally true, Christiana. And, and I wanted to point out, you know, you mentioned several times the, the need for black, brown and indigenous folks to be at the center of things. And I just wanted to make sure that, that we really heard that statement that we need to invite people who are uh, black, brown and indigenous um, who, and who are at the intersections of, of other marginalized populations to be part of the solution. Um, independent living has a statement, um, nothing about us without us. And, and really, frankly, that's what we're asking for is to have the people who are most deeply impacted be at the table, not when they're asked to evaluate the solution that was come up for them, but to plan the solution and help identify the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that seems to be what's missing quite frequently. Um, I want to give you a chance to respond, but I, I do want to point out again, please remember that we do have the Q&A box. If you do have any other questions for Christiana, please don't hesitate to put them in there. Um, we already provided an answer for the one that we've gotten. Uh, but again, I would like to give you an opportunity to respond to what I had just said, Christiana. Yeah, and like I said, not only to evaluate the solution, identify the problem, but also oversee, lead, and hold accountable for folks to be in solidarity with them. Um, you know, there's this sort of old uh, metaphor around sort of uh, DE and I uh, being sort of like a dinner party. And so the diversity is that you are hosting this dinner party and you send invitations to folks. Um, inclusion is supposed to be that you offer them a seat at the table and something to eat. Belongingness, by the way, is the extent to which someone feels that they should be at the table or that they um, are actually invited at the table. And equity is that the folks at the table uh, proactively have a uh, opportunity to have a say of what's on the menu and what they will eat. To take that even further, um, maybe we don't wanna have a dinner party. Maybe a table isn't the best organizing home. Maybe there's something else that we need to consider in our, in our place of moving forward 
And the, the delineation of that is between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge, anyone can gain knowledge. All these books over here is me trying to gain knowledge, but you're not gonna have a wisdom unless you have an embodied lived experience of what it is that you're learning. And I think what's really hard to share about this with folks who identify as allies or accomplices, or even folks who are in solidarity and moving that work beyond being an accomplice, is that if you do not have the embodied lived experience, you will only ever have knowledge. You will never have wisdom. You will not have the nuanced understanding of what it means to have that information actually played out practically in the real life experience. That is why it is so imperative to have the leadership of those most impacted. Because if you're trying to say solve, like, you know, oh, well, how do we reach out to black, brown, indigenous, disabled folks? But you don't have any black, brown, indigenous, disabled folks in, at, that, at that conversation. You're probably not going, not even probably, I will guarantee you that you are not going to know to the nuance and detail and understanding of what is truly needed because it is um, perhaps a great level of knowledge, but there would be a lack of wisdom in that, in that situation. Thanks, Christiana. I, I just had a quick comment. Would you say that uh, inclusion is uh, inviting Black, Brown, Indigenous folks to actually decide whether you have a dinner, dinner party or not? I think inclusion is the, the way that I operationalize inclusion in this work is inclusion is the action on behalf of the person who is owning the house. Um, so if you are the executive director, um, inclusion would be you offering to the person, hey, come on in. We would like to include you in this. Belongingness, though, is the, is the impact of that. It's an intent versus impact conversation. What I like to say, impact over intent. Um, I will, I will, I guess, uh, take my language from PG to G with this, but as the old adage says, the road to heck is paved with good intentions, right? So while intention is important for your personal development, your professional development, your reflection and how you're disrupting the world from yourself, what's really important is your impact and how that's landing. So the difficulty with like saying, hey, I'm an ally or an accomplice is that you have to ask yourself, did anyone tell you that? Did the people that you are working to serve tell you that? Because that is not something that you can take on. That is a designation. And so that is what's really important to hold um, because if you are doing a whole bunch of equity work, but you're not being told that the work you're doing is impacting the people who you intend to serve, it might be time to reconsider and re-strategize. Exactly, exactly. You, so well-spoken. I'm gonna give a quick interpreter shift. Thanks. Uh, I also wanted to take a quick second. We did have a question in the Q&A, um, what group said nothing about us without us? That is considered the mantra of independent living. Um, Ed Roberts uh, is the one uh, quoted or uh, given, given record as saying that the first time, meaning that you need to make sure that if decisions are being made, uh, that you are including the people the decisions will impact. Um, so don't create policy without the people who are being impacted by the policy. Um, uh, even again, going back to what Christiana was pointing out, um, also including them in, in deciding, well, what is the actual problem that you're creating the policy for is necessary. Um, but again, it was Ed Roberts uh, who is considered the father of independent living, uh, but a lot of other organizations have picked it up because it's, it's so true that you need to have the people who are most impacted involved in the process from start to finish. Hey, this is Robin. I wanted to, to comment sort of from some things that Christiana had talked about earlier. Um, you know, the idea of ensuring that people who, who are sort of most marginalized by the situation are the ones who are leading the charge. And I just wanted to share observations that I've had, you know, uh, in, in nonprofit leadership or just sort of in society in general. Um, 
there sort of is this mentality that the system for the most part is fine. There might be things that are wrong. And if we bring one or two people of color, one or two disabled people, one or two LGBTQ people, whatever, uh, and, and talk a little bit, like it's just a matter of sort of shuffling. And I feel like that is a huge myth that I really want to break down. And I see Christiana smiling. So I, I am interested to know, Christiana, like what, what, where your head is at right now. Um, because it's, it's, there is some sort of like kind of belief that most of it's okay. It's just a little where I think if you truly stop and listen, especially to folks who are truly at the margins of society and the way that our society has been structured, that it is not just a little shuffling. It is a whole dismantling and reconfiguring um, and that it truly, it's not just a matter of listening to uh, people with these lived experiences. It is conceding leadership. It is conceding power. And it's truly ensuring that people with that lived experience are, are directing the whole thing, not just trying to shuffle. So that's in a nutshell. And again, Christiana, with the smile and the nodding, I'm interested in, in where your head is at with that. Part of me is debating whether or not I should tell this story, because there's a story that I tell, I can probably make it really quick. There's a story I tell to explain a little bit about, so we talk about like the structures of oppression as a, as a metaphor, right? Um, our Thomas Roosevelt um, was sort of considered one of the four thinkers around sort of what we know as sort of uh, DEITM, right? So like, what does it look like to have diversity in the workplace? And um, he he shared a story that is outdated. So I share, a, I share a story inspired by him about elephants and giraffes. Um, so long story short, um, I'll try to say it really quickly. Um, there was a, the, the story goes that there was a giraffe and the giraffe was an architect and that art. And so this architect giraffe sort of created this building that was perfect for giraffes. It had high ceilings and the windows gave privacy. Um, it had uh, the right sort of stair stepping and, and it, it had sort of this atrium in the middle where people could eat their leaves. It was so well made in the society where giraffes sort of ruled the land that they even won awards over it. They were in like giraffe architecture digest. It was a whole situation. So the giraffe was hiring for a position and one of the people who applied was elephant. And the giraffe thought, I know elephant, we've worked together. We've been on panels together. They're great. I think I'm gonna hire them because I think this is gonna be a good fit. So elephant shows up to giraffe's organization and realized right away they couldn't get into, they couldn't get into the door because the door was too narrow. So they had to take the bolts off of the door so elephant can get in, which is sort of like accommodations, right? But they didn't really address the fact that this entire building, despite that one accommodation is going to be a problem, right? So that's why disability justice says it's beyond accommodations. And that's sort of the delineation between disability justice and well, some folks say the delineation between disability justice and disability rights, that it goes beyond the ADA and accommodation. So anyway. Elephants in there with giraffe and they're having a conversation and giraffe says that he has a call in the other room. So he go, the giraffe goes in the other room to have that conversation and elephant is trying to make themselves at home. That's what the giraffe said. So giraffe, uh, so elephant went over to look at uh, something on a table in the far corner, it looked like a project and they started to hear a crunch. Like, oh crap. Maybe I should go join a giraffe. They try to go up the stairs. The stairs started to buckle. They fell backwards. They had a hole in the wall. Giraffe comes in and they're like, what the heck is happening? Elephant was like, I'm just trying to make myself comfortable. And giraffe was like, mm, I think I see what the problem is. I think you're too heavy. So part of your onboarding package is going to be that we're going to send you to, we're going to give you a gym membership so that you can lose weight, so that the floor can hold your weight. And the giraffe's like, uh, maybe. And uh, the elephant's like, maybe. And then the giraffe was like, and you know, also, the issue with the stairs is that you're not as light on your feet as you should be. So we're gonna send you to some uh, ballet classes so you can learn how to do that. And I really hope you do because we really like you working here. And of course, the elephant's like, 
I don't think this is going to, you know, satisfy the issues of, of being an elephant, being in a space that's meant for a giraffe. Um, so the reason why that's a story I share is because the giraffes in the situation are those folks who have always sort of held systemic institutional policy making, resource making, uh, decision holding power. They're the ones who have been building those structures, the master's house, so to speak, that Audre Lord spoke of, that the master's tools will not dismantle. Because in this case, the master's tools was sending this person to go and change themselves instead of creating sort of a space of universal design. So when we're talking about sort of what Robin brought up, you know, and we talk about like, you know what? Maybe we'll reinforce the floor but we're not gonna change the full structure. Well, that's sort of like knocking out, you know, a wall in the kitchen of the inequitable structures, right? Um, and the difficulty with that is that, you know, while it may make the flow of the inequitable structures um, more open, it's not gonna actually address the fact that the structure is still standing. And so one of the biggest difficulties with folks in sort of the change management of this is that um, folks are like, but these are the walls and these are the bounds and these are the structures. But what I have to appeal is that if we can already acknowledge that within these bounds, inequity exists because inequity exists within the bounds of the society that we're in, which is why we're talking about it, then we also have to acknowledge that we have to break out of the bounds of our society in order to make equity work move forward. And that would take change, that would take risk, and that would take discomfort, which are also three of the things that humans really, really hate to do naturally. Um, so what we really need to do is dismantle the structures of inequity and oppression. And then actually we have to then fortify the foundation but before we get to that, we need to do a full environmental review. So in addition to the structures being inequitable, obviously we got to get, you know, we have to dismantle or reconstruct that. In addition to looking at the foundations of oppression and the things that are upholding and perpetuating it, we definitely have to address that. But to what extent is the soil, the water table, the mysterium, all the way down to the bedrock of the issue toxic? To what extent is that seeping into our space? And to, what's the, and to what extent is some of the inequity in our space emanating off of us? If you have a well on this, you know, in this metaphorical property that we're doing, then, um, and you're like, okay, this well is toxic because the water table is toxic, we should move it. It's also important to go upstream, right? Because if upstream is where the toxicity is, it doesn't matter how many times you redig your well and try to um, and try to detoxify it. If you're not taking the time to go upstream and say, what is leading to us having to do this in the first place? So the reason why I share this story as a metaphor is because it's it's sort of a way to think about literally the depth and breadth of the work that we have to do in bringing about equi equitable spaces and structures and why it's so, so important for the folks who has been the elephants in the structure, who have seen the cracks in the foundation, who have been drinking the poisoned water, who has been struggling to plant things in the toxic soil and who are trying to talk about, hey, we should probably look at this toxic thing upstream to be the ones centered in the leadership because they obviously are the ones in that moment who have the most nuanced and embodied understanding of what's happening in that space. As opposed to perhaps someone who's coming in over a uh, sort of video chat and like looking around and saying, okay, well, because I'm, because I'm the person in charge here for whatever reason, then this is what I'm gonna say in my video survey, but in that case, perhaps they may be very knowledgeable about environmental reviews, but how are they really going to give it the full um, weight that it in in um, 
and the time and energy that it needs if they're not even there, if they, if they haven't even smelled the air that's toxic, if they haven't even tasted the water that's toxic, let alone been inside of the structures that are inequitable and oppressive. Christina, thank you so much. That elephant giraffe analogy I'd never heard, and I love it. I am going to have to to practice that in in future descriptions. Thank you. Several people commented that that was just so clear, and it makes so much sense. So thank you so much. Um, we've never done this before in these series. Uh, we're going to try to unmute uh, an, an audience member who had a question and raise their hand. Uh, so Emily Hart, uh, we're going to try to unmute you, and feel free to ask your question or make your comment or, or whatever it was that your hand raised for. Oh, Robin, I am so sorry. I accidentally did that. I apologize to everybody. I wish I had a brilliant question to ask. I'm enjoying everything though. So thank you. I apologize. That's so funny. We put you on the spot and you, I yeah. know. Hey, <laughs> I apologize. No worries. All right. Um, Christiana, gosh, uh, I could, pivot or I could respond. I feel very compelled to respond to something that you had said. I thought it was really interesting. Um, you were talking about, I don't even know exactly what you said, but where my head went is the medical model of disability. Right. So I don't know if people are very familiar with that concept of the medical model of disability versus say the social model of disability. Um, and also sort of how that concept of sort of having like masking or trying to fit in or code switching, like how that all sort of fits together um, and adds to this conversation. Ah, <laughs> uh, so um, bringing it back to racialized ableism, here's another compounding impact. So masking, um, or camouflaging is a term that is used for folks, um, especially folks who have um, visible disabilities, who are sort of performing as though they don't. Um, so uh, this is sort of, you know, you, the way that you show up in the world, you try to show up as if you're neurotypical or that you somehow, you know, you don't have the invisible disabilities that you do. It also doesn't have to be for invisible disabilities. A good example of masking or camouflaging, especially that's harmful, is like let's say, um, like uh, one of one of my uh, you know sickness pieces is that I'm progressively losing um, strength on one, on my left side, and so uh, there is definitely days where I know that I should be using my cane. And those of you who have uh, been in space with me has seen I have this like mighty staff that I use as a cane because I also sort of use it as a tripod if I need to sort of brace myself or uh, I feel like I'm sort of faint on my feet. Masking is when I'm like I am bringing my cane. I'm just gonna stand and grin and bear it and just take a whole bunch of like <laughs> meth carbamol when I get home. <laughs> um, but that's not good, it's not healthy. Um, but we do that because society has this way of interacting with us when they um, perceive or they realize that we're disabled, that we're trying to sort of uh, uh, create sort of a space around that. Now, code switching is um, per more particularly used in racial equity spaces around how black, brown, indigenous folks feel like they have to perform a certain set of personality traits and skills, and as well as the way that even we communicate, our body language, the language that we use, how we show up in our dress, the extent to which we alter our bodies. So like if we um, are, you know, perhaps not coming in naturally or culturally, a good example is the natural hair discrimination ban, um, which essentially says that the way, you know, kinky coily hair has historically and continues to be seen as um, unprofessional, unkempt. And we have heard some of the stories around folks who have lost jobs or have been suspended or expelled from school um, because they had braids, locks, fro, uh, cornrows, twists, you name it. Um, the intersection of that is a black, brown, indigenous, disabled person 
who needs to mask and code switch at the same time. So I wanted to preface with that because in medical, in the medical model of disability is essentially where we see the person who is disabled as the problem. We see the person who is disabled as not recognizing wholeness, the opposite of that, but to a level of brokenness. And if we can really think about this in terms of when we um, are applying for social services. So like we are applying to D, I mean, I'm just, I'm just gonna name folks, but love you all. You apply to DDA, when you apply to SSDI, when you apply to Section 8, when you apply to DSHS, right? They are coming at it from a space of like, how sick are you? Quantify it for us. Tell us everything that's possibly wrong with you. And then they turn around and individualize it to you. Well, it's because this person has this disorder or this person has this thing. Um, and it, in that space, there is a lack of autonomy. There is this paternalism that the only real person who can speak on your experience of what's happening in your body mind is a doctor. This is also sort of where the mindset around requiring a doctor's note for getting accommodations comes from. Because of course they can't believe you because people always think that disabled folks are trying to game the system. So they require you to go into a system that we already know is ableist and racist, classist and sexist, sizeist and xenophobic um, to get the accommodation letter so that you can get what you need, what you can likely articulate right there in space. And the problem with this is that when you bring in uh, the medical racism aspect of things, there is all this, again, data, data inspired, data centered, data informed, the data that talks about how black, brown, indigenous folks are not believed about their pain. Black, brown, indigenous folks are not believed about the symptoms that they have. They're at a higher likelihood to be told that the experiences that they have are psychosomatic. Black, and, black birthing folks are three and a half to four times more likely to die pre, during delivery and postnatally than a white person. We have this data. Um, and so black, brown, indigenous folks have shown up to spaces code switching, which then in the intersectional ratio, they're like, if you can articulate this and you can speak to this, then are you really disabled? And then when you're in spaces like the workplace and you're like, I need an accommodation, especially like say in my intersection, right? There's this, you know, first, first of all, folks, I sort of code as femme, which is a whole situation, even though I identify as non-binary. Um, but, you know, there's this sort of strong black woman archetype, this sort of deus ex machina where black folks are gonna, especially black, uh, brown, indigenous, marginalized genders are gonna come into your organization and are just gonna fix everything. Um, we've probably seen this trope in movies where you know there's all of these shenanigans coming around and then the sassy black friend comes and, and fixes everything in the end. And that follows folks. So when you show, hey, I need accommodation, the other folks are to code that as vulnerability, weakness, things that are dissonant from the stereotype. But one of the things that I've heard that was one of my favorite quotes is that people are not responsible for the stereotype that you have created about them in your head. So even though you may have an expectation assumption about how someone should show up in space, they really shouldn't be responsible for that. But that's the reason why people mask and code switch. Now, the social model of disability is currently the, the framework du jour or the framework of the moment, but it is being contested. First, let's explain what it is. The social model is essentially that it's not the person who's disabled, it's society. Society, culture, policy, and politics are putting barriers in place for folks to live their full, whole lives. So if we were to just, you know, if we were to build universal design, if we were to just have standard curb cuts in our sidewalks, if we were to 
prov provide every child with an IEP instead of it having to be something to fight for, um, then, you know, essentially we would solve the lion's share of the ableism and oppression that disabled folks serve. Well, the pushback to that is even if society, culture, and policies were to change, there are some of us who are still going to be disabled. We're still going to have pieces of our lived experience. We'll need assistance, we'll need treatment, we'll need medicine, we'll need care, and we'll still likely need accommodations. And beyond accommodations, we'll need to be seen and recognized in our wholeness that this is just how we are. And we need to be held in that space. So it's important for us to also think, and someone talked about the human rights model disability in the chat. It's important for us to think about all the different sort of frameworks. Um, and I guess what I'll end on for this particular question too that's important is that I do see a lot, of, you know, going to that cross disability solidarity I do see a lot of folks, you know, they argue about this um, because in the middle of that too is the rehabilitative model, which I feel like we all have. And that's when people come to you and they're like, have you tried yoga? You know, the keto diet is supposed to be really great for people with epilepsy. You should think about it. And, you know, I heard that if you just start cooking with a cast iron skillet, that could probably solve your anemia. And you know what? The rehabilitative model is essentially just like if you just try hard enough and you like clap your hands a couple of times, then like the magic will happen and you'll no longer be disabled. And that's also harmful. Um, so <laughs> what's important about this is also to recognize that everyone is going to have their frameworks and the spaces from which they're coming around this work. So I always say when we're doing equity work, we really need to think about it like a wagon wheel. Um, if you think about a wagon wheel at the center and the hub of it, that would be your equity goals or really your equity covenant. Uh, covenant I use specifically because a covenant is a shared embodied core agreement that everything that we're doing is leading to this thing. So if you say your equity covenant is as simple as bringing parity to areas of disparity, that's what you're doing. That would be the hub. The spokes around the hub would be the multiple pathways that folks can take based on where they are and what they're able to do, as well as their level of commitment, consent, and concern. I think the difficulty with equity work is that we assume that everyone is just on board or they're antagonistic. And there are a lot of those folks. But in addition to that, there are folks who may be concerned about equity work, but they're not committed to it. And there may be folks who are um, consenting to do equity work, but they're not really into it. And I see the consenting folks primarily, you know, in government areas where they have like an RSJI or a race and social justice initiative or something like that. Um, so it would provide multiple pathways towards the shared equity covenant. They don't have to be committed to it. It doesn't have to be their entire life, but there is a pathway to them having that impact over intent. The folly is the metal part that holds those spikes together or those spokes together. And the folly would be your accountability structures, probably a community accountability structure, as well as how you're gonna make this work sustainable, effective and collective. So you would need to make sure that you had something like that to make sure that no matter where folks are on those spokes or in that wheel, that they are going to be held tightly together while you are moving this work forward with shared agreements of how you will show up in space and make the work happen. And finally, the rubber around the folly is literally, the tire around the folly is literally where the rubber hits the road. That is where you're going to have your tactics, your strategies, your policies, the things that you're going to do to bring parity to areas of disparity. So what's important about this is thinking about the ways in which we can think about this work as a wagon wheel. And I really do believe that that framework, which um, which I'm still, I'm still working on. So if you have any feedback for me, please let me know. Um, but I do believe that that approach will help us to have the most effective collective and sustainable way forward. Thanks, Christiana. Um, 
I'm going to ask a question that came up in the Q&A, and then I think uh, Kimberly was going to maybe pivot to kind of a, a, the next phase of the conversation. So someone asked, what is coding? Yeah, co so coding is um, a way of saying that someone is showing up in space and being interpreted and understood as a thing. So um, it, it doesn't have to be exactly that, but that's essentially what it is, is that you're being interpreted and you're being interpreted and understood as something. And that something may or may not be true. So like when I show up into space, I'm usually interpreted and understood as femme. Um, and that's sort of what happens. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but it means that's how I'm coded. Another way to talk about this is sort of, I always say that my personal and professional philosophy is social constructionism. That's when the humans humaning with other humans come together and make meaning out of things in the world that they don't collectively understand. So, and we do this all the time. Um, when I have implicit bias um, conversations, I do an instant association experiment. And what an instant association experiment means is that I give like a keyword or a concept and I ask folks to the first image that shows up in their mind. So I always say, tell me the thing that you were thinking, not the thing that you were thinking about what you were thinking. Because we have a tendency in pretty quick order to start thinking about our thinking and then changing it. But it's important to think about what, the original piece, because that is really the implicit, you know, we talk about implicit and unconscious bias, that's it. And that's the autopilot that we're on too. Um, so we're on autopilot when we're not actively thinking about equity things. When it is 543 and the dog is over there whining and you haven't peed in a while and you haven't eaten all day and, you know, you're on your sixth Zoom call, you know, then that's what's going to come out. So. I asked folks, what is the instant association when uh, an image that shows up in your head when I say the word professionalism, which is a construct. But the thing about that construct is with some variation, I would say seven out of 10 folks who I've asked that question to has essentially said white, able-bodied, straight-sized person in a suit. And if you, and if, you also sort of had that in your head, even the more to talk about the ways in which these constructs then can come out of our body minds into space and create inequities, right? Because I always say that whenever there's dissonance between what we expect or assume or know even, and what is real, that's when construct comes in to fill in the gaps. So this is also why the natural hair discrimination ban was important because in that archetype of professionalism, it probably doesn't have locks. It probably doesn't have an Afro, um, but that's the way the hair naturally goes out of their head. So I, I had just last week, um, a hiring manager tell me in that example before I gave them, you know, the final answer. Yeah, and if someone came in with locks, they probably would smell bad and we would ask them to have you know, a more kempt appearance. And I was like, oh, wow, 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 wow. Um, so there's a long one to answer to say, like, that's what coding is. Um, and and um, I, will, I will pause for interpreter really quick. So that's what coding is. I mean, you could say coding in, in sort of a, a less human way. Like, for example, my favorite book that I always read all the time, which I don't know if I have it with me like I usually do. I'm like, oh, it's all the way over there. Um, but it's Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, by the way, they, not the movies or a TV show at all. I'm talking about the book. Sherlock Holmes, by the way, has a lot of not only disability justice coding in that it's two disabled folks living together in a home um, who are interdependent with each other, who is trying to find collective access and liberation based on their backgrounds. Um, but there's also a lot of queer coding. There's a lot of intimacy and affection 
that is between Watson and Sherlock. And that is also the reason why Sherlock becomes very possessive and upset when Watson decides to get married to someone else. Um, so coding can also be used in that way too, where it's not being said explicitly, but it's being interpreted and understood as that. This is Kimberly. Thanks for the, thanks for that. I I'm learning so much, and I thought I knew at least a little bit today. Um, so you know, Christiana, one of the conversations you and I have gotten into uh, before is um, a lot of people right now are talking about why do we need to keep doing this? Why do we need to keep bringing up the conversation about equity? And I'm getting burnt out on it, or why do we have to go over this again? And I'd like to know how you'd like to respond, if you'd like to respond to those comments. Yeah, I mean, there's always sort of the, there's always the snarky answer, but I'm only gonna give you um, a light snark. Um, what's really important about this is that, um, as I said before, it's gonna take change, it's going to take risk. It's going to take discomfort. And those are all things that are really, really difficult for humans to want to do in this work. So I'm first going to talk to folks who are allies that I see you, I see and I witness, and I affirm that this work is very, very difficult. It's very heavy, it's very painful. And if you are feeling that, good. Why? Because it means that you're feeling empathy. One of the um, first sort of research projects I did was on the psychosocial basis of altruism. I did my master's thesis on that. Um, and the number one thing that leads to helping or giving behavior in humans is empathy. You have to have empathy. but and people may think that they have empathy, but if you're not feeling it, then it might be possible that you have sympathy. You're concerned. And being concerned is important, but being concerned is not doing the thing, right? So that's one thing. It's also important to hold a sort of understanding as sort of a, a litmus, the extent to which if the discomfort and pain and burnout you're feeling, imagine what it feels like to be in the lived experience itself. When I say privilege, what I mean by privilege is that you have a choice to think about it or not. It doesn't mean you're rich. It doesn't mean you don't have issues or that you don't have barriers or bottlenecks that you're facing, or you don't have situations where you've been harmed. But it is saying that there are situations and it is likely a situation at hand where you're being called you know, you're being called in for your privilege, where you have an option to think about it or not. You can say, hey, I'm burnt out, I'm tapping out. And while I do think it's important for folks to take care of themselves, I think it's also important for folks to always look at the extent to which they are using the privilege to be able to do that. Even if I, you know, and I say this all the time, even if I was to say, you know what, I'm burnt out, I'm gonna go take a vacation. I have to still think about this when I take a vacation. My partner was like, you know, it'd be really cool that I haven't done in a long time. We should, we should go minimalist and we should go in the woods and, and you know, not, not in the campsite, in the woods woods. And then, and then we can, you know, perhaps like bring a tent and do that. And I told, I looked at my spouse uh, who's white, <laughs> who's a white, who's a white, uh, the white dude. Um, and I said, I, 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 I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. Not because I don't want to do it, but because we are in a situation where folks can't even go to the grocery store without being harassed, harmed, or even killed. So there are certain pieces of that where I, you know, I had to explain to him, I don't have the privilege of just leaving tomorrow to go out into the woods without extensive safety planning, ensuring that we'll still have cell service if I need to call 911 and figuring out what our what our safety measurement would be if we did get in you know when we did get um uh talked to so um oops. yeah 
10 more minutes for the questions. So um, for those who are burnt out who with the lived experience, I also see and witness you. And um, I feel that. I, the last thing I will say is that I do believe that there are sort of stages to solidarity. And I'm more than happy if you all would like to see like an image or graphic for that. I have it's something I share in my trainings so I can send. Um, but there is sort of stages. And so I think that at the beginning of it, you know, we sort of start with a discourse, things like this. We start to talk about these issues, we start to get to learn them, and then we start to discontinue them, which is the next step. So once we start to learn more about it, we might discontinue, say, ableist language. We may start to discontinue certain inequitable, you know, approaches or, or ways that we harm. So then once we start to discontinue more of these things, then we start wanting to disrupt it, right? So we stopped using ableist language. Now we want other folks to stop using ableist language. We want to disrupt it so that we can put it into our policies and we start broaching the subject. And likely at this point is when we start to hit some resistance in making the equity, um, the, the, the sort of the equity goals that we have set for ourselves actionable. So then what's important before direct action is detoxification. And let me explain what that means. Detoxification is inspired by the four uh, stages of nonviolent action as laid out in Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter to the Birmingham jail, where he said the four steps of nonviolent action is essentially gathering data, negotiation, self-purification, and then direct action. In that case, self-purification was essentially like if you were say gonna go to the soda counter, they would have folks sort of uh, pull you back off the chair so that your body mind can start to feel what that sensation would be like. So you're not caught off guard in a direct action and you know sort of what that feels like to brace yourself. But self-purification is also extremely introspective which means you're looking at yourself to see what is within your body mind that may come out in this direct action that would be disruptive to the goal that you have, the covenant that you have in why you're doing a direct action in the first place. So this is detoxify, but in detoxifying, like I said, it should go not just to preparing for the direct action and your introspection, but all the way down to, to, the, um, to the bedrock, right? So, how do you get there? Um, and so once you've done that space, and I think especially for direct action, uh, what this could mean organizationally is say you're about to do a direct action where you're gonna ask for a policy where ableist language is a sort of citable offense, perhaps Just pulling things out of my head. Do you have the things in place for that? Do you have precedent? Do you have buy-in? Do you have you have you thought about the ways in which this the organization perhaps may even uh, uh, retaliate? So then, once you do that, direct action, and finally, restoration, rest, rest is important. And I am I am I am talking to myself here in this conversation. Rest is important. Because if we can, uh, people think about burnout as being when you're already tired and you're out of it and you're not trying to do anything and you're sort of dis, dis, you know, disinspired, uninspired. But the first stage of burnout is when we're like, you keep going, you feel like there's too much work to do. You feel like you're never gonna really chase the dragon. You're never gonna catch the dragon. You're never gonna do any of those different sort of things, right? So that harriedness, that sort of like, hecticness around like, oh my gosh, there's so much work and I'm never going to have it. And I'm one to zero inbox. And I'm never going to get to zero inbox. That is the first stage of burnout. If you're in that stage, that is your sign. You need to go to that process of restore and repair. That's, and, and if you're not doing that, um, especially if you're not in an experience, we had more time, we could talk about savior complex, um, but I would definitely can, um, recommend folks to look that up. Um, so that it's something that you can work to disrupt. Diana, thank you so much. Um, there's so many things, again, where my thoughts are and things that you and I have talked about before, which I wish we could talk about here. I mean, this could go on and on. And I just, I really appreciate uh, everything you've said. And um, 
just the time and the gift that you've given us. I, I also want to say just kind of in response to what you were talking about in terms of burnout and just um, sort of the ability to engage in this work ongoing, like in the in the disability advocacy work that I do, we often try to remind folks that, it, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and that also really it's a relay race um, because there's no way that any one person can do it all of the time that there are times that you need to step back and times that you can step up and times that you need to use other people uh, and lean on other people in order to continue to push this work forward. So mm -hmm. I just, I appreciate everything again. And I can't believe that, like, honestly, our time is up already. It's been an hour and a half and it feels like just a few moments. So uh, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of hand it back to Kimberly to, to sort of wrap things up if, if that's okay. Definitely. Thank you so much for joining us, Christiana. This has just been an awesome experience. I have really enjoyed it. I want to keep talking for hours. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the time. <laughs> um, I just want to know, is there one last thing that you want to share at all? Or one last parting comment before I, oh, sorry, hang on. We got, we've got a question in the Q&A. Oh, somebody just telling us thank you very much they learned so much so is there any last parting comment before i i wrap up that you'd like to make yeah um i do think um and when i say that like it i really mean it like it it's it's hard and i and i get it the like i said the fear of risk the fear of change the fear of discomfort um That is also part of the structures and the boundaries that continue to perpetuate inequity that we need to also um, address. There are certain things that we can navigate around and there are certain things that we must strategize through. And if we are to uh, achieve equity, we must strategize through those things. Um, also, when we say leadership of those most impacted, we really mean it. And when we say leadership, we mean fully resourced, full, decision-making power, resource-holding power, the actual power to do the things that you'll be bringing them in for. And that's very, very important. It's also important to not um, only just hire one or two folks um, because you are essentially bringing the elephant into the giraffe's space. And finally, Black Disabled Lives Matter. Black Disabled Lives Matter. Definitely, definitely. Thank you again so much, Christiana. Um, there's a lot of people asking for the link to the first and second sessions. Uh, I will, uh, let me go back, sorry. Okay, as you know, these events are recorded. So we will be sending out the link to this session. And just so that way everybody has all of the sessions, we're gonna pause for just a quick second. Uh, just so everybody has the link for all three sessions, I will include the link for the first two sessions in the email that goes out that has the link for this session. Uh, also, we'll include the graphic that uh, Christiana had spoken about because it appears that there are several people who are wanting that information. Uh, in April, we're going to be focusing uh, the Understanding Ableism uh, series on uh, ableism in the education system in partnership with the governor's office uh, of the education ombuds that event will be on the third thursday april 15th at 4 30 p.m and thank you all so much for joining us today uh, we really appreciate it and uh, please look for the link in your email thank you all and come talk Thanks to me everyone. to piece of equity if you'd like to talk more. <laughs> if you just Google Christiana's name, you will find Epiphanies of Equity and you yes. will be happy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thank you.